They took a piece of reed or cane, they dipped it in water, dipped it in sand, and they would roll it back and forth, and that's how they drilled down through there. It takes about 50 hours to drill down through there. There's a lot of guy did it just to find out how long it took. And in that, they discovered they were finding these little, they look like golf teeth out in the, when they do the archaeological dates. And so they couldn't, they didn't know what they were. Well, here they end up being a core that when they drilled down through there, they broke through. That's what they were finding. And until he did that, they didn't know. So, but that's just one of the things. I got a, a three-quarter groove axe over on the table. The progression of the axes, they started and they put a groove all the way around them. They're called full groove axes. Then they learned that uh, they did it with two grooves, or three grooves. They call them three-quarter grooves. Then they went to a two-groove axe. And finally, they went to this style here, where it doesn't have any grooves on it at all. This one, and uh, what they would do is they take like a club and build a, build a socket in it this size, and then they would uh, tie it in there. And that way, it made it tighter when they used it instead of like the lashings coming loose on the uh, apps. But this is the progression of building uh, points. Um, but they, this is called a blank. It's just a rough shape. And uh, what they would do is they take these blanks. They would. Uh, start a fire, cover it with three or four inches of sand, put these blanks on there, cover it with sand, and start another fire on top. That way it heat treated the arrowheads, which made them harder, like China, baking China, and it uh, made it easier to chip. So when they chipped their arrowheads with the deer antlers, uh, that, and it would also, the heat would turn the stone pink, like it does any like limestone or stuff. So any of the pink stuff, uh, then heat treated. So, these are hide scrapers, or scraping the fat off of hides. This is a gouge for uh, getting wood for uh, hauling up canoes, making wood implements or whatever. So, so. The one that you found that's drilled out, yes, was that part of the tool eventually, or what did you get for? That was, uh, used, I, I had that paper in my hand this morning. Where did it up at? I don't know. But, <laughs> but anyway, they would take a, a tree with a limb growing out, and they would cut it off and they would sharpen it. They used to uh, throw their spears, they would hook that at the back of their spears. Their spears would be hollowed out. And so, and this was a, a counterweight on that to, to help balance it and I'll pull it forward a little bit. And so, so they had different styles and some of them were tied on. And so, really. Yeah, that's that. Uh, and what was the only thing it is on the bottom half? Here's the other half one. I haven't found the rest of it yet. I haven't found the rest of it yet. So did you just find those in an open field? I found them straight across from me in West Raiders field at the time. It was uh, right straight across from my machine shed. Because whenever I find something like that, I take uh, markings, you know, because I see a tree on the horizon, I know where that is. And this one just happened right by the south side of my machine shed, 30 foot out in the field. And I haven't found the other half on it once in a while. And so a lot of people don't till as much as they used to, so it's harder to find stuff. So I'll grab another train. You get closer, huh? You got it. You got it? Are you ready to start that? Okay, thank you. So this is Mallory. I just thank her so much. So you need to Uh, 
and put in the, the black hot um, scotch pitches. I, I'm probably just going to flash through these because I have a whole bunch of slides on here. <laughs> so it's not going to be a full on presentation. And I found the, like, the, the origins of some, some names, like Makobita is derived from the Meskwaki tribe name. And uh, uh, the Mississippi also has roots in, in a Meskwaki language, also known as Meskwaki, by the way. And uh, the Creek by the St. Thaddeus. Uh, it's technically French, but it was also about uh, a, a fight in, uh, in, uh, on the next slide. Uh, there, there's a few different versions of this. I went with the Winnebago versus the Fox, the, the, the Fox version. And that, that's like the little overview of it. Again, I'm probably just going to flash through these real quick. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Just let me know. <laughs> yeah. Am I good to move ahead with everybody a little more time? Okay. So the first tribe I tackled was uh, the, the, the Squawky, also known as the Fox. Uh, so I, I, I went over like, the brief history of them. They're, they're basically best friends with the Sauk tribe. And so they originally began in the Great Lakes before they <coughs> pushed, pushed uh, further south and west into like our, into our area and basically Illinois and I think further into Iowa as well. And uh, uh, in the 21st century uh, nowadays, they actually have a lot of settlements settlements and also a potential reservation. There. This is like, uh, like some fun facts that I discovered about uh, their names and like the different types of plants that they use. Uh, the classic bellflower was from the act of uh, being like a rituals and all that. And so the New England Aster was used to revive uh, unconscious people. Then the purple giant uh, Hyself, uh, the infusion of, of roots was used to induce uh, uh, di diabetes and uh, uh, was used as, as medicine. And for the black pot flowers, they ate, they ate its fruit raw and put, put it into jam. Then uh, the stiff golden rod that they made into lotions and used the, uh, for these things and swollen faces. The, ne the next slide is actually some pictures of those. Then I did a little brief thing about their, their language. They speak the uh, Alg Algonquin language. And they, they have a specific dialect that is native to the Fox, Sac, and Kikku. Uh, and because of their li li linguistic and cultural similarities, the Fox and Sox tribes are often associated with the each other. And the, they participated in the, the Fox Wars, which were named after themselves. Uh, all this occurred before, but it, 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 was a, it was vital to what led to the, to the Fox Wars in the first place. Uh, uh, there's like a lot of uh, um, conflicts with the Europeans. And, uh, but the main thing was that they, they gained control of the Fox River system, and that was vital for a fair trade with the French. And uh, um, during the, all, all, all this, they lost like, a good chunk of the, uh, of the people. 3,000 people in 14 years, actually. But during the visit the war, they got into, into conflict with, with the French, because the French wanted the control of the, of the Fox River uh, thing. And the King of France actually signed a decree for the extermination of the Fox tribe, and it's the only decree of the sort in French history ever made. And there was technically two different class wars. The first one was purely economical. Uh, again, the French wanted to, to uh, uh, control the river system for access to the Mississippi. Meanwhile, 
the, the second one was also about about the Vivas, but also uh, it led to the to the fox uh, uh, finding the asylum with the with, with the soft side, and it really spoke about just how close the fox and soft were, because the soft were on good terms with the French, but the, but but they did, but they chose to side with the fox and ate them in, in their battle against against them. Then uh, uh, the relationship with, 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 with the soft again it was uh, on the very good, uh, good terms with the two. Um, and then they were both forced out of, the, out of their land by the Indian Civil War Act of 1830, uh, signed by President Andrew Jackson, uh, one president I do not like at all. Uh, he really should be taking off with a $20 bill, in my opinion. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, they, 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 they both actually participated in the Black Hawk War of 1832, and afterwards the U U.S. government uh, combined them into the Sock and Fox Confederacy for she and purposes. Um, and then the Black Hawk War was fought in 1842. They stole all of their lands in Iowa to the United States and moved the west of the Red Black Line before we moved again to a reservation in eastern central Kansas. And uh, they were called by the Dakotas to the lost people, since they were, they were having forced to leave their, their, their homeland. But some of the Swati the were actually able to remain hidden in, in, in Iowa. And we're getting close to the end of the Swati, I think. Just maybe a few more slides. Uh, in, in 1851, Iowa the legislature passed, uh, and uh, it's, it's say that uh, uh, the Meskwaki were able to buy back the, 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 their lands. This was very un unusual because the U.S. government declared mayors as non-American citizens. The only citizens could buy lands, but the Iowa government was apparently like, we don't, we don't subscribe to that here. Uh, however, again, they should really have to, ha have to buy it back to do their land in the first place, and they were forced off of it, so at least in time. Uh, they, they bought the first 80, 80 acres of land in Tama County, Iowa. And Tama was actually named after uh, a fox chief, chief in the early 19th century. And then they moved to their new settlement near Tama. But then the government got uh, involved again and tried to force them back to the Kansas <laughs> Motivation by refusing to provide the uh, uh, treaty bound and annual fees. But a uh, decade later, they, uh, the, gov the government gave them and began to pay the uh, Iowa and the Squatty back. And they are officially recognized as the Sock and Fox of the Mississippi River in Iowa. And there's actually two, uh, two separate um, tribes uh, in different places, which I'll be getting to in a little bit. And they gained federal recognition and eligibility for the services of the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. And they had a continuous relationship with the state of Iowa because of the practice ownership of private land, which was held in trust by the, by the, the, the government. But so, so it's pretty strange that here in Iowa, the, the government was on fairly good terms with the native uh, tribes. You don't see that often. Uh, th three years later, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, the Maswati actually benefited from being ignored by the federal and state politics, and they uh, were able to live more, more in, in, independently and able to live out their, 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 their culture. Uh, in 1896, the state of Iowa ceded to the federal government all jurisdiction, all jurisdiction over the year of the Maswati, and by, 18, and by 1910, a total of about 1,000 people uh, were, were, were part of the Fox and Sock tribes. Here in the 20th century, the, the, the recovery of the culture began. The numbers increased to, to about 4,000. And fun fact, during World War II, the Squawky men actually enlisted and served in the U.S. military, and they served as co-talkers, using their native language to uh, safely send their messages. So, uh, like, because obviously German and Japanese forces would have no clue what they were saying, <laughs> which is, very true, since people here in America have no clue what they are saying. Right? <laughs> 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 
And then another, another example of this is that uh, um, the, the, the Meswaki men in North Africa used that method against the German forces. And in January 1941, um, 27 Meswaki men, 27% uh, of the Iowa's Meswaki population too, enlisted together. And uh, they have uh, a modern settlement again in Tamar County. And they have a casino, tribal schools, tribal police, and a public works de department. And then lastly, there are three federally, federally recognized tribes. There's the Sac and Cross Nation in Seattle, Oklahoma, then the, the, one, the one here in Tama, Iowa, and then the Sac and Cross Nation of Missouri in Kansas, and the Nebraska in Louisa, Kansas. Next are the Sauk. Uh, they were also uh, made to move around a lot. Their, their, their origin is the same Lawrence River in New York, and uh, that is quite a good distance for them to cross all the way from New York to Iowa here. They were driven out mainly by the uh, Iowa League, and many migrated to eastern Michigan and settled around the uh, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it that right. Saginaw. <laughs> Saginaw, there you go. Uh, before moving south to Wisconsin and Illinois, and they primarily lived in present day Green Bay before again moving and uh, settling in uh, Iowa and Kansas. And that was around, around the time they, they took in the, the box. Uh, one sub group eventually moved to Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska, uh, and probably later becoming part of the uh, Kansas. The Nebraska Class and Sock tribe. Uh, the larger Sock group were forced into Indian territory, aka Oklahoma. But some were able to escape back to the Midwest and were resisted and joined the, joined the Fox so as their friends. Their, their main friends were mainly the Pada Watomi, the Meskwaki, the English, and temporarily the New French. I found a couple of uh, well-known SOC uh, tribe leaders. There was uh, Kiyokuk. He accepted, Kiyokuk. He, he accepted the loss of land as inequitable, since like, the white settlers clearly uh, had a single-minded, uh, I don't know what I was going to say there. <laughs> uh, he was more focused on keeping the peace and preserving his people. Meanwhile, Black Hawk, uh, uh, believed that the Sauk were forced into war by being deceived, and he was probably right about that because there was a lot of uh, underhand tactics being used against the native tribes around that time. In 1832, he led a band of motion stop into Western Illinois, leading to what is known as the Black Hawk Hawk War, which was obviously named after him. He was eventually defeated by General Edmund P. Gaines, so. The Sauk uh, signed in, uh, 22 treaties in total. They also had a, a, clan, a, a clan system. They were divided into two modes, and the sub divisions were Apache lineages and then clans. Uh, there was the Kishko, the AKA the long hair. They began their skin with white clay and their color is white. And uh, uh, today, they would be mostly associated with the Democratic Party. Meanwhile, the uh, Oscars, aka the, uh, the gray, they painted their skin with red charcoal, their color, the color was black, and nowadays they would be associated with the Republican Party. Both the Republicans played at the cross, by the way. And they, they played it they, they played it brutally to toughen the uh, uh, warriors up, and, and they, they usually played it like uh, combat uh, uh, training, recreation festivals, and preparation for war. Also part of the clan systems, um, there were a bunch of different types of, uh, of clans. Uh, obviously, bear, beaver, deer, eagle, fish, fox, and like ocean, sea, great lake clan. The Peace Clan, Potato, Snow, Thunder, yeah. Warrior, and Wolf Clan. Mm -hmm. uh, they called the, the, themselves the people of uh, the Outlet at, at one point, uh, as well as the Yellow Earths because of the yellow clay soils around the Saginaw 
Like, there's that one again. <laughs> the French called them uh, sock, uh, sack, and then the English called them sock. So that's where the, those two names came from, by the way. Um, general knowledge about their language. I think it's pretty well known that all Native American languages are pretty endangered. And it's also, once again, a dialect of the Fox and Kikuku language. They had a syllabic orthography for their own language, and a common book was published in 1945, uh, 1975, sorry. It was meant to help modern days and soft to learn how to read, write, and speak there to traditional language. And a new orthography was written to help native English speakers learn the, the, the language. And a concise dictionary of the soft language was published in 2005. Uh, the next one was about their loss of language. Uh, the, the official tribal language uh, uh, began to decline with bounds in uh, 1935 and 1945. English was becoming the common language. The reason for this was because um, in the Native American schools, the use of, of their language was actively discouraged and always severely punished. Another issue was the syllabary first created was written with a day of soft speaker in mind to teach, and since English became, became the main tongue, the syllabary was a was I was able to find uh, uh, a lot of uh, like uh, uh, this uh, uh, table on the with, 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 with Wikipedia about the, the phonology of the of it. They had like nine to ten co consonants, and on on that table you can see uh, uh, the different uh, consonants. We have uh, four vowels and two semi-vowels, and on the, the, the table on the four vowels, I couldn't find the semi-vowels though, so I don't know where those are. But. And from the quote up there, the vowel length is important in the soft language because uh, of, of its distinctive fun function. So like uh, one, uh, one uh, letter could be pronounced one way, it means something else, and then another way it means something different. Pitch and tone uh, were also important because uh, um, uh, there's a general rule of emphasizing the first or second syllable, so syllable of phrases, and slowly fading away at the end of the word. And it has a swallowed quality at, at the end of phrases and words too. Uh, Soft is also a polysynthetic <coughs> language, and I also have a couple of examples of uh, uh, some sentences, some like. Words and sock. I'm not going to pronounce it because I doubt I will be able to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> then the third and final one are the uh, Elaimi. I think I pronounced that right. I, the next slide is actually how to correctly pronounce it. Uh, Elaimi, yep, yeah, Elaimi. Uh, Paulina Lionel, I'm calling you out right now. It's not a lion, it's a lion. I'm calling you out. <laughs> uh, they had a, a, a great variation of names. Uh, French missionaries noted that the uh, uh, lion referred to themselves, themselves as Inoka, but the meaning is unknown. Uh, Jacques Marquette, the namesake of my school, by the way, uh, claimed that Illinois was derived from Illini in the Algonquin language and it meant men. In the 21st century, the linguistic research showed that that's Illinois derived directly from Irwinatois, which means he speaks in the ordinary way. Most, most Illini spoke the Miami Illinois language, the Algonquin family language. The exception, however, was the Mr. Gamia, who spoke a, a Suan dialect. Um, the uh, Algebraic pronunciation sounded to the French like Elaine, and uh, I'm studying over myself right now. Elaine is a singular form of Elaine. and French explorers recorded it in various transliterated forms, like the three below. <laughs> I'm just going to pass over to my class. 
there were, there were 12 different tribes in the, in the Alliance, and they were actually also known as the Illinois Confederation. Uh, uh, they looked mainly from uh, Lake Michigan to Iowa, Illinois, and down south to Missouri, and even to uh, Arkansas. So they covered a good stretch of land there. The current five remaining tribes uh, are the Karapukaya, uh, Kaskaskia, Mishugamia, who I mentioned before, the Fura, and the Tamawa. And then the, I have listed the, uh, the, the lost tribes, and uh, they became lost through disease and warfare, and they, they eventually became extinct. In the 17th century uh, was when they were first documented by, by, the, by Europeans, and the population was about 10,000 people strong. Today, they are descendants of part of the Miami, Oklahoma, as part of the Confederated Tribe of the Kiowa. Their daily life mainly uh, uh, involved uh, I, I, agricultural stuff, so like farming, hunting, and fishing. And they lived in longhouses, as pictured to the left, and woodlands on the right. The men mainly hunted and participated in war, while women cultivated fields, created tools and clothing, and presented food. Uh, women's uh, uh, roles, uh, roles also included uh, positions of leadership, including the evangelistic ones. They could become shamans and priests, and could, and, uh, could enact powers that led to death, and were revered and feared by men and women alike. Women could also participate in hunts, but were denied the use of weapons, so that kind of the purpose of them being there in the first place. Big science to do it, I guess. <laughs> uh, women mainly achieved status by growing about bountiful fruit for others, raising many children, and being a, being a faithful wife. Unfaithful wives was, uh, were given severe punishments, and sometimes had pieces of, of their face cut off. <laughs> they were also a poly society, and uh, first wives often held superiority in the leadership roles in, in their family. Uh, it, for, for men, uh, they, achieve, they usually achieve status through battle, courage, bravery, and their hunting skills. And usually this led to a great number of wives, and that was seen as a sign of great respect in the, in the, in, in the village. And uh, uh, curiously, I also found that um, some, uh, some uh, aligning were raised as the opposite gender. Uh, current uh, uh, ethnographers theorize them as being bisexual and technically also trans trans transgender. So it's young boys who have a female qualities were raised female and vice versa. They learn the skills and language specific to their age gender. So rather accepting those guys. <laughs> Uh, villages were, were usually led by one great chief, and, the, and, and the each village had uh, several other chiefs who led the each individual tribe. The best known and largest village was the Kaskaskia established village. Uh, in 1675, the French built a Catholic mission, uh, the mission of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin, to be exact, and a fur trading post nearby, and the population increased to about 6,000 people, all in 460 homes. Uh, however, Eurasian disease and the fever wars, which I'll get to in a little bit, but higher mortality rates. And the population coming in throughout all of the tribes. And then let's go to a few uh, uh, French men who were uh, interacted with the Elani. There was Louis Toilet, pictured on the left, Jacques Marquette. In the middle, and then uh, this guy has a really long name, so I'm just going to call him Lord Let Let the Sow <laughs> on that face. Their language is also part of the Algonquin language uh, family, and uh, but their their dialects came from uh, uh, Illinois and the and the um, Miami tribe. Uh, no native speaker, speakers can really remain, but the rival efforts are, are are in progress, and children from Illinois and Miami are slowly learning their ancestral language. It's also a, a polysynthetic language, and it has a complex verb morphology and a family free word order. And that's actually a book available on the, on Amazon about the Miami uh, uh, Illinois language, written by David G. Costa. Next, 
in their religion. And all social roles and positions were very re 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 religious, and they relied on spiritual guidance to dictate every aspect of life. Uh, hunters depended on spirits to help them catch wild animals, and warriors asked for, for guidance before wars. Shamans, again, were regularly called on to resolve matters with physical and, and mental health. And in the late, late 1600s, Jesuits arrived and tried to convert the uh, Illinois to Christianity. But if a great portion eventually did, but some tribal el elders wanted to retain and preserve their beliefs in the, the spirit world. Uh, some, some of their traditions included uh, uh, dream seeking. Um, when boys and girls of about 15 years old uh, reached uh, uh, that uh, age, they would paint their faces, isolate themselves, fast, and pray. And this would reveal to them their spiritual guardian, so kind of like a spirit animal and that they would, they would depend on for the rest of the, 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 their lives. They were called the Ma, Mani Tokito. And uh, uh, this was an important uh, ritual of becoming an, an, an adult. There was also two separate burial pr pr procedures for intact bodies. Uh, the, uh, the bodies were ceremonially dressed and placed in, in, in the graves with the objects to, to accompany them to the afterlife. However, with skeletons, they were placed on scaffolds before the, the, the mm -hmm. ceremony, and only of a, a, the only people of the same gender and age could be on the burial crew, which I kind of I was kind of worried about because if it, uh, there, if there's a young person, <coughs> the other young people have to carry it too, mm -hmm. so it's too kind of kind of protected there. Uh, and a wooden cover is usually placed on the top to prevent animals and environmental factors from disturbing the years age. The uh, economy was also rather big. They were also rather self-sufficient and participated in a large trade network. Uh, they exported highest birds and also, unfortunately, slaves from the south and west to the Great Lakes region. Uh, other, other tribes and French traders were their main contacts. And in return, in return they got guns and European food. And through this, the Illini uh, started to move away from their self Deficiency and became very dependent on the French for their, for their economy. They were also based on, on agriculture and fishing, and their agriculture was very big. Uh, villages, villages were usually built close to rivers uh, for the fertile soil. Their major food was maize, aka corn. They also planted beans, squash, pumpkins, and watermelons, and gathered the wild food in the forests. Uh, corn was uh, uh, usually planted in late spring and harvested prematurely in July, and most was then preserved for the, for the coming winter. Meanwhile, the second harvest collected ripened corn and, and ate it and, and ate it in the warmer months. Fishing wasn't relied upon much. Meanwhile, bison were uh, very, very sought after for hunts, which I will be talking about next. How to hunt bison? They were, they, they were usually. Uh, split into several groups, surrounded the, 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 the bison, and when in close proximity, uh, the first group would shoot arrows and spears to force the target in the, in the opposite direction, and the other group would, was lying in wait and would then make the uh, kill. Then the women would skin, would skin the, 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 the bison and preserve the meat and uh, uh, dry it and, and heat it to save for the winter. The uh, or like the largest part of the this presentation, I think, because they had a lot of other information. Uh, in, in their warfare, raids were usually organized by chiefs in February, and for each battle, 20 men were invited to peace with, with the chief. And this is also when the warriors would pray to the uh, Manitou. Uh, lots of war parties were include both men and women, and uh, capturing prisoners was usually preferred over death. And the, However, sometimes prisoners were, were eventually killed and or forced into slavery. Uh, they usually preferred arrows and spears over guns, because guns were seen as slower than their own weapons. However, they employed the noise of guns to frighten their opponents before a battle, especially if the opponent had never hit a gun before. Because like, imagine you never hit a gun before, then all of a sudden as you bang and go down, you would be rather startled. Uh, currently, the Alani aren't a confederation by definition, but I'm one of a segment of tribe. 
They share a common language and are culturally similar throughout all of the, all of the tribes. The Nihonka Federations are culturally dissimilar but still retain the same identity as the rest. Uh, their government uh, is rather uh, large too. They, they, they have been one large nation at some point, so it's been divided into smaller tribes, but became an individual tribes when the population grew too large for effective hunting and, and agricultural needs. Even after the split settle, each tribe had a strong sense of immunity with the, with, with the others, and uh, uh, still saw to each other as the aligning nation, if they, even if they called call, call each other by different uh, tribe names. Chiefs were also widely respected, but the uh, aligning was also more of a democratic society, and important decisions were made by a tribal contested, consensus. Through the expansion of European ideas and contact with French officials, chiefs also began to wield more power over their, their, their people. And in the uh, 1760s, new chiefs had to be approved by colonial authorities when the white settlers came in and started doing everything. Uh, keep stepping on this thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, they were different types of, uh, of chiefs in the government, too. Again, the great chief uh, ruled over. Uh, Everyone. And then there were the, the village chiefs, and then peace chiefs and war chiefs. Peace chiefs uh, establish and maintain political leadership uh, by organizing communal hunting expeditions and, commu and communicated with other tribal leaders. They were highly respected, but did not have the authority the village chiefs did, and they made decisions through peace and of force. War chief chiefs usually planned and led raids. It's not an, an an inherited position, but achieved a demonstration of great battle skills and between other warriors that they ran to could lead them to a victory. They were responsible both for compensating families of deceased warriors through gifts and vengeful, vengeful raids against those responsible. The settlements, uh, there, are, there are a lot of conflicting reports on the, on the village numbers and population density. The first European documentation stated that the Alani had villages along the Mississippi and Illinois rivers. Their population was about 8,000 to 9,000 people. And another, another report said only five villages and a population of 2,000, but the first report is believed to be more accurate. And I think, I think the first one is more accurate because considering how large the, the, the Alani were, it seems more, more, more like, likely. Uh, the Alani were also said to be about 10,500 10, people strong by the time of European contacts. They also have quite a lot of enemies. To the north, again, the uh, Iroquois are uh, back again. They were the biggest threat and they placed the Alani all the way into Kansas. The Dakota Sioux, the Osage, the Pawnee, they were also in conflict with the Sac and Cross Nations and the Arikara. And then to the south, they had the Kopa, Shawnee, and Chickasaw, and then in general, the Europeans. <laughs> and then this is where we hit the Beaver Wars, aka the Avokwe Wars, and the French and Avokwe Wars. In the 17th century, the Avokwe, of course, uh, the Kaskia and other uh, Illinois southwards. The Illinois fought back, but the war scattered the, the, the people and the decreased their numbers even further. And they, they were able to eventually uh, reclaim some of the, their land, though. The, uh, the Avoke really were like the bullies on the, play, on the playground. Mm -hmm. They were always attacking people. Mm -hmm. Then we come back to the Fox Wars. In the early, early 1700s, they became in, in the Fox Wars between the Fox and the Bench. Uh, and, and they sided with the Bench against the, 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 the Fox, I believe. Yeah. In 1722, the, the Piora were attacked by the Fox for killing the nephew of one of their chiefs. They were forced onto Star Rock, and the Piora sent, sent a plea for help to the French, but they did not arrive, arrive in time, and by the time they did, uh, many of the Piora had been killed. The French, Alani, Miami, and Padawatomi, and some Sac uh, allies fought against the Fox, unsuccessfully in the 1730, but they received a, a Fox village, and it was a very brutal attack. And I got a, a quick timeline here. Uh, in 1832, uh, they were pushed out once again by the Iroquois uh, in the Shoshone before, before they accepted the reservation at the Big Muddy River south of Kaskaskia. 
Within a few months, they migrated to a reservation in Kansas and ceded the rest of their, their territory. In 1854, they merged with the Wea and uh, Kayanka Shaw nations and renamed themselves the Confederated Kiora tribe. In 1867, they resettled in a new reservation in Northeast Oklahoma, and uh, joined, they were joined by members of the Miami, Miami tribe who joined the Confederation. The Union lasted about 50 years before dissolving in the 1920s, and remaining members sought federal recognition from the U.S. government, and they eventually achieved it in 1978. And modern-day descendants are found in Ottawa County, Oklahoma. And that is basically the end of it. Yes. Again, I got some of my information from my local library. And then all that stuff is just my quick quickly all with you with all my sources and all that. That's the end. Valerie has done an awesome job. Can you imagine how many hours she has spent researching all this? Certainly a credit to herself and to her school, Mark, and high school. So thank you for this. Oh, would you tell them a little bit about what you plan to do? Did you tell me the journalism? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, I'm, I'm going to go into NICC and you do the paralegal. Yeah. She likes to write. Thank you so very much. I just, <laughs> and she certainly has a lot of composure because when technology doesn't work for me, you know what happens. <laughs> but she, she hung in there and they got it together. Thank you, Sue and Mary. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you for doing this. It will become part of our history forever. Send some more of your classmates our way, okay? Because we need a lot of, a lot of these things. So, um, Gene Kiefer has come, and he heard about Mallory's program, and was interested, so he wanted to come and visit. And then he brought some of his own artifacts, as we told you before. And maybe if we do it over there, Gene, is that easiest? Okay, he has some of his things over there, so anybody who would like to hear about where he found some of his things and what they are, well, maybe that's going to be hard. Maybe you better do it. I'll bring things to you. Okay, thank you so much. All right, I appreciate it. So, this is going to be shown on YouTube, our YouTube channel. So all your family and friends will watch, okay? And I'll get that information to you. All right, thank you. Mallory asked to be excused. She has got other things to do. So, so I'm going to
learn to recognize some of this stuff. I can find one of those little rocks and think, well, just oh. give it a toss. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've gone to several archaeological digs. And, oh. and so you're working with those people. Actually, I worked on my uh, certificate in archaeology to the University of Iowa. And so I'll be a certified archaeologist, which is worth about two and a half bad boys. <laughs> this is my oldest point. It's a um, um, agabasic point. And, uh, they know, they know how old they are because when they do an archaeological dig, they dig a pit 12 centimeters by 12 centimeters, and they go down three centimeters at a time. And so then they'll bag that, and then they send it back to the University of Iowa, or they'll do a water float test. So if there's any seeds or carbon from a fire, whether it be wood or grass or whatever, they can radiocarbon date that. That way they know how old that point is by the age of the carbon dating. That's why it's illegal to dig in Iowa because you lose all that information that is around that. They call it in situ. They lose all that information. If people go out and dig, people do do it. But I don't do it. You can surface hunt in Iowa because that's been disturbed by the field, the plows, and stuff like that. So it's, surface hunting is okay, but you cannot dig. So, yeah. Oh, this one I found near where I found that one there. So I think it was a pretty major site. I don't find any flakes where I find this this stuff. So I assume it's a burial site. Because otherwise, you start looking for flakes when they made them, they would hit chip that stone. And you see all kinds of different flakes. Primarily white flakes, because that's primarily uh, uh, Burlington, Ford, Church, Flint, and some from Burlington, down in the Burlington area. And there's 13 different types of flake in Iowa that they use. So, and these are, that's a, all for Miller, so it's a complete Miller. These are just sometimes they're called bird arrows, they're not really just for birds, because even if they were shooting coon or whatever, that animal to eat, they still have tough hide they got to get through. So they, well, they were just kind of nicknamed bird arrows. Anybody has any questions? Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, well, not Paul. I worked with uh, Dirk Parkers. Dirk Parkers, yeah. And stuff. And we, we did a, Elaine had gotten a, a thing for finding the, uh, he's an horse did a search on Indian Mounds back in the 30s in the CCC program. And so we went back, I don't know how many years what it was after that. <laughs> so, so, and we went back and um, researched the mounds and what condition they were in. And, uh, it was with Dirk and we found 12 new mounds and that's down by uh, the Green Island area down there above the bus there. So we got, that was interesting. We also did an archaeological survey in uh, Dubuque up the mines of Spain. And so we would go out and did the surface hunting in the field in the morning and then in the afternoon um, I got to go out with timbers and what we we're looking for out there is smeltering pits. What they would do this is when they were mining the lead and uh, stuff. But they would just take and build it uh, like a rock dam, and then they would uh, fill it with wood. They'd throw their uh, lead ore on that, start it on fire, and the melt would come down through the dam. They would pick that up and then take it down to the river and sell it to the community for making bullets. So, Then we call these rocks, which <laughs> this has a slick dimple in it, and that's for uh, uh, cutting, breaking uh, acorns, walnuts, whatever else, you know, whatever stone for it. And this side has a slick dish to it, um, you can't really see it very well, but it's uh, for grinding corn, or when they made acorn, they would make those acorn meal, they would grind that all the time. This stone my sister gave me, gave me she, uh, found it in uh, the Sorensen house. And, but what it is, it's a form for uh, making moccasins. And so, um, so they would build their moccasins off this free form. And the neat thing about it is it's uh, you know, the right foot and the left foot. So. <laughs> this is a game ball. And how one of the games they would play with this would be uh, to they'd take a, like a willow and put it in a circle and tie it, and then they would roll that across the ground 
and try to throw the ball through it as it rolled through the ground. This is one of several games they had. I got a book on different games. And this is going back to the three-quarter groove axe. So it's grooved on three sides. And I found that up in Scott Tillman, he's filled. And it's broken, of course, but uh, yeah, so like you see when it started, it was all the way around, not the end of the transition to that over there. And this is a hammer stone, and it looks pretty much like a regular rock. So you know it's a hammer stone because of this in the middle, it's called pecking, and they were used to that as a hammer. If anyone wants to try it, if you put it in your right hand, this just fits your hand perfect. And then the outside rim around here is real smooth from grinding on the stone. That. So that's so they know that that was actually used. Or some are out in the field, and I don't pick them all up anymore. <laughs> and they would um, make these, they would use this end of the antler and get it in a rough form of goodness. And there's people that still do this today and are very good at it. And even the Indians that did do it were very good at it. So they would get it in a rough form of that, and they would pressure flake it by, they would take it, put it on their leg, and then push on it with this, and then they could chip that off. That's how they made their points and stuff. So there's people very, very good at this. Um, one example is there's 700 some arrows in a mound uh, at uh, Keokia. And Keokia has the largest mound in the United States, 22 million cubic feet carried by hand. And that was one mound, or several smaller mounds around there. And in this mound, there's a chief was buried, and uh, it was 700 of the Keokia points, and there were very fine points, and it was just uh, baskets full of these points. In and uh, he was buried there on 20,000 whelk shells. Now, the whelk shell comes from the Gulf of Mexico. So they traded extensively for the different goods they needed. But it was laid out in the shape of a Thunderbird, and he was buried on that. And uh, they said there was one guy that needed buried there and 13 others that didn't need to be buried there, so they were sacrificed. <laughs> so, yeah, it's good. Yeah, that's about all I have here. If anybody wants to come up and see, I got so this is a tame up point. Um, and uh, so this is the book I, one of the books that I go up and show us it here. And uh, agent description tame up points are common throughout Iowa. They are similar to random points described at Kiosk site in Illinois. Tame up points are often dated around the middle of the late archaic period, around 5,000 to 1,000 years BC. Quite smaller shape and cover from the middle of the context. So, but yeah, so I think a lot of my stuff I learned from this book. But, um, and how I go about trying to start to look for these is uh, my rules get close to waters and get the people up in floodplain. And so, at my place where Sugar Creek dumps into Deep Creek, I find them there quite a bit. And on the other side of the creek, I don't find anything. I don't feel like, look several times and I can't. So it seemed like they always just stayed on one side. And many times when I go, you gotta look up around. I just, that's where, where water dumps into another creek, you know, no matter what the size is, that's generally where they were camping at. And I haven't done a lot of camp uh, finding Indian camps up in the hills. Uh, mine's primarily down in the flatter area around Preston and stuff. So that's about all I have right now. Any questions for Gene? What started you um, to be interested in all of this? Well, like they say, your hobbies pick you. <laughs> but I always, just as a young kid, was interested in, you know, point. And then once I started learning about them, I was wondering, you know, what tribe would use them? Well, they really don't go into the tribe so much more in the time period because of doing that. But there was all different tribes through there and stuff. I don't know how many tribes were in Iowa at that time, which was close to 15 or 20 or more. How old were you when you first found something that you could identify? That would be this point here, this adolescent point. Uh -huh. um, I was 13, 12, 12, 13, so over 50 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't realize that until a couple years ago, I started adding it up. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> the law about digging, does that pertain to you searching for things or us, the common people that make me dig? I didn't know there was a law about that. Yeah, uh, I can't. I can't do it. I won't do it um, because I know that I'm 
I'm not good enough to keep all that information. You know, it's all lost. But and it pertains to more U.S. searching or <coughs> even us as property owners sitting around in your yard. Ex-delta, yeah. No, that's okay, but yeah. mainly like as you're searching. When you do a burial mound, do they actually dig like you found? You could dig, you have... Yeah, you know, because it's you're a, you're, a group Yeah, you're very controlled and stuff, so... That's yeah. how you found all those baskets. Thunderbird and all those. Well, that's just information I have. Well, oh, okay. I've been there twice. I've been down there twice and I actually did a dig um, working on part of my uh, certificate with a guy that uh, was down there and that's the one who told me that there were 13 there that didn't need to be buried there. So he was actually did the dig. It's a professional dig. It's, he's from the uh, IBC area. And he, they travel around and want to certify our county and go and go to those digs. Any other questions? I'd like to, we have a lot of people interested in Native Americans, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe we can get Gene to come back. We have a magic eye. I mean, we didn't know about this until very last minute. So we have a magic eye back there that you can put something under it and shine it on the screen so you, everybody could see really well what he's talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Would you come back and sure. play with that a little bit and yeah. do something like that for us? Yeah, Okay. <laughs> just like to make a little bit. So that would be good. Okay. I, I would just like to just say one thing. I you know, I asked him about I asked him about um, Paul Sayers. And you know, he was he was such a great he was not a he was not a licensed actual archaeologist. He was an amateur. Right. But his collection and a lot of people wonder why all the wonderful arrowheads that he found in Jackson County left Jackson County and went to the University of Iowa. And they're at the office of the State Archaeologist Office, thank you, in Iowa City. The reason that they went here, and I think Paul deserves such great credit for this, his collection was not the largest Native American collection around, or maybe not even the best. But the reason, as I understand it, that his was chosen to be used as kind of the, the baseline for Native American studies in the entire Midwest was because, as Gene was saying, he was so careful to document. He dug his so many, and every so many centimeters or something, he documented exactly how deep he found each arrowhead or each artifact, how far it was from the next one. His documentation was so perfect that that's why his collection was chosen to be there. And I understand now some of his things have come back to Jackson County because the Office of the Archaeologist has used them and studied them and they don't have room to keep everything. So maybe out at the sit at what was the Sayers Museum on the out by the caves that's now the visitor center, some of his original findings are back out there again. But, um, I mean, when I came back, I was really upset to find that all of our artifacts had gone away to Iowa City. But that's a, I learned finally very good reason for that. So, anyway, if Gene knows so much, he could share so much that you would be so interested in. Well, we worked together, and uh, uh, we were able to get uh, some of the, few of the artifacts from the Art of Kyle collection, which is an extensive collection. And I kind of tried to keep it uh, together and, Get donated to the thing, but uh, it was already sold. We're the same. Point. Yeah, so so it was went up for auction, and it's all been spread all over the United States. So and we got some of them. So that was wonderful. Yeah. So who helped with that? You helped with that, and Chuck. Chuck. Yeah. Chuck Jordan. Sure. So Ardo Kyle's wonderful, extensive collection, as he said, went away from here, put up an auction, just went everywhere. But some people from here, probably led by Gene and Chuck Jorgensen and somebody else. Yeah. A couple other people. Hey, wait a minute. Dennis kept some of it, though. Well, the family may have kept a little bit. Because he's got some in his basement. Maybe. Some of it. Yeah. And the family sold a lot of it. It did not stay, most of it did not stay in Jackson County. Most of it. And we saw thousands of things go away. And that was heartbreaking to Jackson County. So Gene got these people together and they went to the auctions and they purchased back things and donated, donated them to our historical society. And if you go to the museum on the fairgrounds, you can see them all. It's a 
and all that we were able to, to save. Yeah, there's about 75 or so points on the one board that I did keep, and the rest, I would say there's close to maybe 20 boards of that size that, were, oh. that are gone. Or, you know, and I'm sure they're probably broken up ones. But cause I understand there one guy, and cause they, this was online also, and the one point, uh, it was uh, made out of uh, the volcano glass. Lava. lava, yeah, the lava glass, and it went for three thousand dollars. So that's that was one of the points where lost all over the United States. That was just a great loss to Jackson. But thanks to doing some of it. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for coming, and thank you for sharing. You know what to vote. Yeah, I see this year. So they know that, you know, they what chip will have to give back like that, no matter what size it is. So like that. This one has been uh, retouched into a height scraper. Yeah. Well, you know, Steve, too, uh, he just retouched a 61. But anyway, he has Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't know.